Well, thank you, Joe, so much for having me. And it's so fabulous to be with all of you at the end of your workday. I promise to make the most of our hour together. It is going to be interactive. And I plan to give you tools, stories, and inspiration in making the shift from hierarchical to democratic leadership. A lot of you are in New York, but I would love to hear and chat where you're from. I see uh, Mark coming in from Ottawa, Canada. I see Kazi ca calling in from Brno, Czech Republic. I love the Czech Republic. Tell me where you're, where you're in. New York, New York, Metro, New York, Brooklyn. I was joking around with Joe and telling him I live in New York. I live in in South New York, which is in West Palm Beach, Florida. <laughs> so great, New Jersey, we've got, oh, Berlin, fabulous. Oh, wonderful, originally from Morocco, that's awesome. Well, it's so great to see uh, each of you here and we're gonna be engaging in chat as we go along. So stick with me. As Joe said, I am Tracy Fenton. I'm the founder and CEO of World Blue. And what we're gonna be talking about today is three simple shifts that you can make right now to shift your team or organization from that hierarchical command and control, outdated leadership style or organizational style into a much more democratic and freedom-centered style. And I'm going to define what all this means. And so if you think talking about democracy, I'm not talking about a political context. I'm not talking about voting. I'm talking about it as a leadership style. We're going to get into that. And of course, you all as Agile, I've spoken at many Agile events. I love the Agile community. A lot of our clients practice Agile. So you all already understand, I believe, how important it is to have these more uh, decentralized and collaborative ways of working. So I hope what I can give you today are some tools as leaders that you can immediately apply either in your team or overall as your organization to make your agile practice even more, even better than it already is. All right. So let me just tell you quickly about World Blue. Uh, I founded World Blue in 1997 and we are a global uh, ship and uh, culture training company. We've worked with top brands around the world, uh, representing over 30 billion in sales. I'm just wondering how many of you maybe heard of World Blue? If you've heard of us before, um, give me a hand up if you haven't. That's totally cool. Um, but if you have, I'd love to just, you know, raise your hand if you've heard of World Blue before. We're called World Blue, color of freedom universally. And our vision is to see a world where everyone can live, lead, and work in freedom rather than fear and control. Okay, so just briefly on us, we've been doing this work that I'm about to teach you for 25 years. Um, we've worked in over 100 countries, and we've trained over a million leaders worldwide, and to make that shift from hierarchical to democratic leadership. The method I'm going to teach you of leading with freedom and democracy rather than fear and control uh, has on has on average companies that practice this have on average 700% greater revenue growth compared to the S&P 500 and have 95% greater organizational resilience. All right. So it's quick on our, some awards we've received. Um, I've received the Thinkers 50 Awards, Oscars Award of Management and Leadership. I've been recognized as one of the top 50 leadership thinkers by Inc. Magazine, um, World Changing Woman in Conscious Business, one of the top 100 coaches in the world, so on and so forth. And by the way, I see some of you are, are chatting with me and I will definitely take your questions afterwards. Here's a list to your question mark um, of some of the companies we've worked with worldwide. Zappos, Hulu, Pandora, WD40, Groupon, um, Davida from New Belgium Brewery, uh, companies from small to Fortune 500s we've worked with worldwide. All of these companies have also been, not every company you work with, but every company on the screen here, have all been certified as freedom-centered organizations worldwide. I won't get into it, but this is our very rigorous standard that evaluates companies in how democratically they are actually organized. So if you have a fabulous culture, like your culture to become worldly certified, it's a simple uh, but very substantial process that we put companies through and you can ping me afterwards. But the stories I'm about to share you today are all from World Blue Certified Freedom Center companies. You can find 
all of them on our website at worldblue.com. All right. And as Joe so kindly mentioned, the book is out called Freedom at Work, the leadership strategy for uh, your life, your organization, and our world. And I encourage you to check it out. I wrote it to be... Um, Interesting and engaging, not boring, lots of stories. I feature 50 World Blue Certified Freedom Center companies that we've worked with worldwide. And I give you over 100 best practices in freedom at work. So uh, beginner, intermediate, and advanced practices. All right, so let's get into it. So we're going to talk about how we make that shift from hierarchical to a much more democratic leadership style. And in order to do that, we need to understand, well, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? And I believe the problem that we've identified at World Blue is, is actually one you don't normally think of, uh, and it's fear. Fear is the issue behind almost every leadership or team or culture dysfunction that we butt up against. Now, fear wears a lot of different masks, and I understand what fear looks like. We're able to identify it more easily. So fear looks like unnecessary hierarchy. I do think I'm not advocating a flat, entirely flat organization, but unnecessary hierarchy is the result of that hierarchical command and control mindset driven by fear. Fear looks like frustration. Fear looks like anger. Anxiety and stress, that command and control leadership style, procrastination, manipulation, bureaucracy, micromanagement, disengagement, and that pyramid structure. We've all experienced these behaviors. We've all felt these behaviors before. And at the root of every single one of them is fear. Now, when we lead from, from a place that that's when we see characteristics like low self-worth, people who are mean and moody, leaders withholding information, acting in a way that's negative and toxic. Leaders who don't take personal accountability are arrogant and egocentric, are emotionally manipulative and use fear and control to get things done. All of them of that fear-based leadership style that creates that command and control hierarchy that is outdated, no longer relevant, and certainly does not allow us to adapt to all of the dynamics of the world in which we function. The problem with fear is that it kills good decision-making instead of giving us the ability to think long-term. It makes us think and react more short-term. It kills bottom line growth. It kills productivity and engagement. It kills innovation, morale, and truth. It kills agility. It certainly hurts our health and well-being, and it kills really great leadership development. So does this leadership style, this style of fear and control and hierarchy make any sense? Absolutely not. So what is this new way of leading? And it's really not a new way of leading, right? It is a timeless and timely way of leading. Well, I believe the future of leadership is much more freedom rather than fear-based. It's freedom-centered, democratic leadership, not fear and control. In fact, 81% of employees believe that they could do better at their job if they just had more freedom. Now, when I use the word freedom, I'm certainly not talking about anarchy or a laissez-faire approach. Freedom requires discipline, accountability, and a framework to bring it to life. And I'm going to teach you exactly what that is in just a minute. We each world blue in order to bring freedom to life is what we call the freedom at work leadership model. It has three simple pillars. Pillar number one is all about having a freedom centered mindset. Most of us have a fear based mindset and that's where we get into trouble. So we've got to cultivate a freedom centered mindset. And I'm going to give you a tool for how to do that in just a moment. The second pillar is freedom centered leadership rather than fear based leadership and having the tools for how to do that. And the third pillar is freedom-centered organizational design, freedom-centered organizational design. Joe, I don't know if everyone's muted, so I don't know if there's a way to, or if everyone can just mute because I'm hearing some background noise. Okay, so that old way of doing leadership is command and control. The new way is freedom with personal accountability. 
The old way is hierarchical. The new way is collaborative and democratic. The old way is fixed. The new way is flexible. The old way is practice-based, trying to just replicate what everybody else is doing. The new way is principle-based. So understanding the principle that then drives the practice. The old way is bureaucratic. The new way is certainly agile. The old way is sad and creates anxiety. And the new way is happy and joyous. So the first step of the three steps I'm gonna teach you in how to make that shift from hierarchical to democratic leadership it starts with our mindset. And it's about having a mindset of freedom and possibility rather than fear. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, Tracy, I don't have a mindset of fear. Um, I'm fearless, good on you. But I will tell you, most of us have low level to high levels amounts of fear. The, when we use words like stressed or anxious or you know frustration or all the things I talked about before, all of that is fear. Interestingly, the average person thinks 60,000 thoughts a day, 60,000 thoughts a day. 95% of those thoughts are the exact same thoughts we had the day before. And shockingly, 80% of those thoughts are negative and fear-based. So most of us do have a lot of fear rumbling around in our heads. And unfortunately, when we're coming from a place of fear, that keeps us from really making good decisions that makes us better leaders overall. So how can we make that shift in our mindset from fear and control to freedom and possibility? Well, we have a great tool that we teach at World Blue, which I'm going to teach you today called the power question practice. Yes, the practice and the quick story behind how I came to create this uh, process is when I was in my mid 20s, I was living in Washington, D.C. I was a full time graduate student. I had started my company, World Blue, and I was also working for the Nasdaq stock market, traveling all over the world, speaking just crazy, crazy schedule. And what I call a new mentor of mine, because I was feeling very stressed out and anxious and just completely overwhelmed. And I sort of, you know, barfed out my whole story to my new mentor and she listened and listened. And then she said, Tracy, I have just one question for you. And I said, great. What is it? And she said, what would you do if you weren't, what would you do if you weren't afraid? How would you handle those problems? What uh, actions would you take? What conversations would you have if you weren't afraid? And I didn't realize how much fear had been sitting as a weight on me. But in that moment, I instantly saw what I needed to do to move forward. And I started to call that question. What would I do if I weren't afraid? The power question. Because when we are in fear, we are not in our power. But when we are coming from a mindset of freedom and possibility, that is when we actually step back into our power. And let me give you an example of this. One of our clients, a World Blue certified company is called Boost. They actually practice the Agile method. Our third company based down in uh, Wellington, New, uh, New Zealand, down in New Zealand. And, um, oh, Joe, do you hear there's some background noise there? So I don't know if you're able to mute yeah. folks or not. But I, yeah, I made, I made you the host, so it would be you and not the co-host. Oh, right? okay, so sure. Can, you know. Is there a way that I do that? Mm, I think so, yeah. Maybe. But I don't see anybody on <laughs> mute. <laughs> no problem. We'll just take a quick little commercial break here. Let's see if anyone's unmuted who doesn't want to be. Okay, um, here we um, go. We love you. We're just going to mute you for a minute here, um, just so we don't pick up any background noise. All right, I think we're good to go now. Okay, awesome. Joe, you're not muted. <laughs> Don't make any noises. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Okay. So let me tell you the story about Boost. So Boost down in New Zealand, their CEO um, had a big problem. He was looking at the beginning of their fiscal year and saw that uh, by April, five months into their fiscal year, they were going to be $300,000 behind. And he found himself, as many of us would feel, you know, feeling very anxious and stressed out and wondering what he's going to do. And he, the first thought that came to him when he told me the story is he's like, I was just going to go into the office and start sort of knocking some heads around, telling people what to do, telling people to get their hustle on and solve the problem. And fortunately, he had been trained in the power question method I'm about to teach you. And he realized 
what would, he asked himself that, what would he do if he weren't afraid? And he realized that what he would do if he weren't afraid is he would go into his uh, senior leadership team. They call themselves the navigators. And he would talk with them really frankly about here's what's going on. And instead of feeling that he himself had to come up with the answer, he would actually open it up to them, the five members of their leadership team to come up with ideas of what they could do. So that's exactly what he did. He calmed himself down. He didn't spew fear on his team and they had a great discussion. They decided they would take a week and everyone would go and reflect on ideas of what they could do. They came back. They had ideas of how they could lower costs, how they could get more business from current clients and attract new clients. They put their plan in They really tried to act from that place of freedom rather than fear. And as a result, when they got to April, they weren't behind 300,000. They made up the 300,000 plus an additional $200,000 and um, came out doing very, very well. And this was during their slowest time of year that they achieved this outcome. So same 30 people, but you can see the impact of their leader, their CEO, just bringing a different mindset to the equation and how that immediately impacted behavior didn't stress people out more, but allowed them to pull together to really solve the problem. So now what I want to do is teach you our power question practice. It's five questions, and we're going to go through them together. And this is where we get to have a little bit of audience participation. I am going to move slightly quickly because I'm going to teach you two other shifts, but I would love it if you would engage with me in this to the degree that you feel comfortable. So again, I'm going to go through five questions that you can use yourself in your life and also with your team. You can do it as a collective tool to help people get unstuck and help people be more creative and innovative, help lower stress and help them shift from that mindset of fear to the mindset of freedom and possibility. Okay, here we go. The first thing I need you to do is think about a challenge that you are being faced with right now. It can be a personal challenge or it can be a workplace challenge. Um, it can be a financial challenge, be a relationship issue. It can be a problem with a colleague. It can also be a challenge of should you take an opportunity to do something? So I want you to just you know grab a pen or your phone or your computer off to the side and uh, just jot a word or two down of what a challenge may be that you are facing. We all have challenges in all different forms. So just any challenge you're dealing with. What? What? Okay. Now I'm going to ask you the first of five questions we're going to go through. So the first question, as you think of your challenge, is what are you afraid of? Now, again, some of you right now are totally going to be with me on this. You're going to be like, yeah, I realize I'm afraid. And some of you are going to be hitting up against the ego, telling you, I'm not afraid. What is she talking about? So uh, if the word fear triggers you, just think about what's stressing you out. You know, what's making you feel anxious? What's causing you to lose sleep? So what is it that you're actually afraid of? I want you to jot a few notes on this. Often what we're afraid of when we really go deep on stuff, it's, you know, sometimes it's, I'm afraid that if I have a conversation with this person, I may be fired. Obviously not talking about reckless fearlessness here, but, you know, people are afraid of, um, you know, being fired or ending a relationship or um, a financial difficulty or missing out on an opportunity. But what's important is to go even deeper as you think about what you're afraid of. Because at the core of the, it is often the fear that we're not good enough. We won't have the resources, the fear of what other people will think of us. So to the degree that you feel comfortable, um, I'd love it in chat if people wouldn't mind just sharing what they're afraid of, just a sentence or two or a word or two, just what are you afraid of? And you can share it to me personally or to everyone if you want. I won't say names. Um, I just would love to hear what fears are coming up for people. Right, that do it. Yep, right. It's that fear that we're not good enough, that we won't be able to to get it done. Yep, fear of failure or fear of being judged, and it's exactly it. Those are the biggest fears most of us have: the fear of being judged or the fear of what others will think of us. Fear of losing trust, confidence. Um, um, fear of losing trust and confidence of being a part of the solution. 
solution, right? That you get part of the solution. Afraid of losing friends in the network. Yes, thank you everyone for sharing. These are fabulous, exactly. So um, any other fears, just feel free to pop them in. The, I mean, I think we all can relate to these fears. We have all felt them before. I know I have myself too. So yeah, fear of taking a risk for something when you don't know the outcome. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Jumping full into starting consultancy, um, being a solopreneur. Yeah, that's that's a scary thing. I understand that as an entrepreneur myself. Fabulous. I'm going to go out, take us to the next question now. Great participation, gang. I really appreciate it. The next question is this. Why are you afraid? So we've talked about what you're afraid of. Now, why are you afraid? Are you afraid of something because someone once told you you weren't good enough? Are you afraid because you're projecting into the future um, a fear? Are you afraid of something because something happened in the past? Um, why are you afraid? Go deep with this. Why are you afraid? And feel free to share. Thank you. To be wrong or not to succeed. Said, Great. Yep. Why are you afraid? And usually if we were together in person, I'd give you quite a time to reflect on this. So I appreciate y'all going with me full time. Yeah, past failures come up. Yeah, sure. Uncertainty, right? <laughs> like my house and insurance. <laughs> yes. There are no guarantees that the business relationship will resonate with the customer. Yeah, sure. Why? Putting your ideas out there that others won't rally around. Yep, that's scary. Not sure I have full control to keep my commitments. Yep, yep, exactly. Yep, we all understand. Thank you so much for sharing. It's fabulous. So let's go to question three now. Question three is the power question. So what would you do if you weren't afraid? If you didn't have all these fears rattling in your head as you think about your challenge, what would you do? How would you solve that problem? What conversations would you would you have? What actions would you take if you weren't afraid? So think about that for a minute. And again, feel free to share either directly or to the group. What would you do? Kinder to yourself. How would you be more fearless? Yep. Great. I'd go for it and not care what will happen. That's right. I would take all the necessary action steps without hesitation. Yep. Just do it. Exactly. I dive in with my instincts and just do it as Nike would say. I love it too. You wrote that. Uh, three of you wrote it. I just do it. Right. And that's the thing about fear it keeps us from taking that action. It, it creates analysis paralysis. So great. I would tell myself, uh, how can I exactly? Okay, is anyone else having big gaps and pauses in my audio? I just got a uh, message flashed up that my connection was unstable. So I'm hoping it's coming back a little bit better. A few here and there. Okay, is it, uh, is it, is it better now, I hope? <laughs> I hope it's better. Okay, audio is good enough. Okay, good, good. And maybe it, it could be the remnants of the hurricane that we've been passing through. So I appreciate you all um, sticking with me, at least on the audio. All right, let's go to the fourth question of five. Now you've thought about what you would do. How would you feel without the fear? How would you feel without the fear? Tell me in chat, how would you feel without the fear? That fear was lifted off of you, that uncertainty. How would you feel without the fear? Go ahead and let me know in chat. Confident, absolutely, right? In control, definitely, totally certain, confident, and strong. That's right. More rested. Oh, that is so true. I find when I'm in fear, I fear, feel exhausted. But when I'm in freedom and possibility, it's like, I don't even need caffeine, right? You just go for it. So more rested, confident, strong, in control. That's right. Absolutely. And in the flow. I love it. I love it. Fabulous. Fabulous. And now let's go to the last question, which is this. So why is it okay to let the fear go? Why is it okay to let the fear go? This is a really important question because we've gone through this. We've identified why you're afraid.
to let it go. Uh, for me, I'm a really smart person. I believe the universe is good. I believe it's working um, in, in my benefit. So that's what I trust. Um, but what about for you? Why do you feel like it is okay to let it go? Is it okay? That's a fair question. Yeah. Is it choppy still? Oh, shoot. Maybe I should go off um, video. Maybe help. Yep. Yeah, fear is in our survival brain. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, people will say to me sometimes, well, Tracy, I like fear because fear means I'm going to make better decisions. But actually, the brain research tells us that when we're in a state of fear, we are in, we get tunnel vision and the peripheries of our, our brain shut down, we actually become myopic. So we're, we're not able to make as good a decisions. And instead of relying on fear to motivate you or to make you take action, I would encourage you to rely on a sense of purpose, um, a sense of wisdom, a sense of discernment of life experience. That's what can help you um, move forward. So yeah, yeah. Okay, I see your note, David. Great. In my experience, people around you want you to be successful, so leverage them. That's right. Rather than fear, mitigate risk. Exactly. So why is it okay to let that fear go? All right, fabulous. So these are the five questions. Okay, audio only. Do you want? Do you guys want me? Just switch to audio. I'll do that, and that'll um, uh, uh, stabilize us a little bit more. I don't don't know why that's happening, but yep. Okay, good idea. I hope this works. I'm going off video. Okay, great. Someone let me know if that's going to be any better. I hope that's the case. I don't know why it's unstable. I think I'm going to blame it on the hurricane. Okay, great. Okay, so just so you have it, here's that summary of the five steps of the power question. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? How would you feel without the fear? And why is it okay to let the fear go? And, you know, just as a, uh, this is something you can use in your own life. I, I love to take these five questions and actually every day uh, journal about them either in the morning or in the evening before bed, just to kind of clear out my thinking. And I invite you to do the same. One of my good friends is Gary Ridge. He's the CEO of WD40. And he used these five questions, uh, as many of our CEOs do, when his team got stuck, his executive team got stuck. They took the five questions. They went through the questions together, the power question practice together, and it helped them have a major breakthrough as a team. So I hope you can take this tool forward and really help it create innovation and breakthrough success. All right. So that's the first first shift. <laughs> oh, good. Just put them on the front page of a new notebook. I love it, David. That's awesome. All right. So that's our first shift we just talked through in how to shift from hierarchy to a much more freedom-centered style of leadership. So now let's get into step two, which is leading with freedom, not fear. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, again, there's <laughs> not again, there's three three attributes of a freedom-centered democratic leader. I write about all of this in depth in my book, but what we've identified are the three attributes of a freedom-centered leader are love. So acting from a place of love, also known as self-worth. There's lots of things, of course, you could say about love. Uh, in the book, I talk a lot about self-worth and how that impacts our leadership style. And it's what I'm going to talk about today. The other two are power, which is self-government, knowing how how to self-govern, self-manage. And the third um, is a word I learned many years ago when I was in South Africa called Ubuntu that relates a lot to self-knowledge. I only have time to hit on one of them today. You can certainly read about the other two in my book. All right, so what exactly is self-worth? Your self-worth is your sense of your inherent value. It is how, how much you love yourself and feel secure in who you are, okay? Self-worth is not self-confidence. Confidence is situational. Worth has to do with who you are, how much you like and love yourself, regardless of your imperfections, right? We all have imperfections. We all have things that we're still learning. None of us is, you know, 
we're all still in progress, right? But that ultimately shouldn't affect our sense of self-worth. Now, what's interesting, and I've found in 25 years of working with top leaders all over the world, is that your level of self-worth impacts your level of effectiveness at leading yourself and others. Um, again, in the book, I, I go into detail about the characteristics of low and high self-worth. But I just want to plant this seed in your thinking today. And I'd like you to think about the answer to this question. And I want you to, you don't have to tell me in chat. I just want you to write this down on your own, the answer to this first question. On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the highest, how would you rate your level of self-worth, not self-confidence, not self-esteem, self-worth and, and why, all right? Give yourself a number on a one to 10. How much do you like or love the person that you are? How secure do you feel in who you are and why? And why? Just jot down a number privately to yourself right now. All right. So my personal belief is that every single one of us ultimately is a 10 in worth, right? We might not know that. We might not realize that. In fact, for some of you right now, you may be flinching at that idea. I'm not a 10, right? I remember when I was living in Washington, D.C. years ago, one day I looked up from my desk out the window and I saw a big city bus go by and it had a huge uh, uh, ad on the side of the bus. The ad had a Citibank logo, had a white background and in giant black letters, it said, you were born pre-approved. You were born pre-approved. And that's what I believe. I believe we all, each and every one of us are a 10. And it's really interesting to think being a 10 does not mean you're a narcissist. That's not what I'm talking about. If you know, narcissists are a one in self-worth. Okay. <laughs> when you are a 10, there's a sense of joy. There's a sense of stability, a sense of humility. Uh, doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean we aren't still learning. None of that has to do with your worth. Um, so when we have high self-worth, right? We want to create an environment where others can also succeed, where others can be successful. But when we're struggling with our sense of self-worth, we feel threatened by others around us succeeding and performing well. So again, I, I, it's really interesting. I talk about this in the book, but at, at length, in the CEOs that I've worked with, really, really, it's so important, whether you're a CEO or leader, to understand how your level of self-worth impacts your behavior. And now many times as I'm working with teams and coaching them, they'll tell me about a challenging employee that they have, right? We all have those challenging colleagues we work with. And I'd invite you to think about where's their level of self-worth on a one to 10. Um, I can promise you if you're really having a challenge with them, either they're a 10 and your self-worth is not yet there, or they're like lower than a 10. Anything in the eight or higher range, eight or higher, I consider the high self-worth zone, but ultimately you're going for uh, that 10, right? right. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what, where has the time gone? I'm going to tell you a couple quick story, a quick story here. There's a fabulous uh, company we worked with called DaVita, Fortune 500 company, and their CEO, Ken Theory, KT, um, was asked to come in and transform DaVita back in 1999. And KT had a really, really firm sense of his own self-worth as a 10 and the worth of every other employee that he had, everyone on his team that he calls his teammates. Now, Davida, it wasn't called Davida at the time. It was called Total Renal Care, horrible name. Uh, um, and he went into the company that was on the edge of bankruptcy under investigation by the SEC. Morale was low. People were uh, jumping ship, high turnover. And he says, because I believe in the worth of every single person in this company, we're not going to act as a company. We're going to act as a democratic community first and a company second, meaning we're going to put the people first, the people's voice, giving power to our people because every person has worth. I tell this story in detail in the book, but he did a number of just fabulous things that gave power to people, honored their voice and honored their worth. And as a result, uh, very quickly, they were able to take the company from the edge of bankruptcy, well, 
to where they are today. They're a $15 billion healthcare company with 52,000 employees worldwide. I've spent a tremendous amount of time with them at their headquarters out in Denver, Colorado. And uh, the atmosphere there is just amazing. Absolutely amazing. KT has now retired as CEO. Javier Rodriguez is their new CEO, and he is continuing to operate and lead DaVita from that place of high self-worth where every voice matters, every person matters. They're a democratic community first and a company second. All right, now let's get into our third and final shift or step that you can make shifting from a hierarchical to a democratic style. And it's giving power to your people by designing democratic systems and processes. So for those of you who are really operationally minded, ready for where the rubber hits the road, this section is for you. Okay, there. what we have found in independent research is that there is a 75% correlation between your organization's systems and processes. In other words, how you get things done and how democratic your culture is or isn't. So this is really important. Culture is actually driven by our systems and processes. <clears throat> yes, it's driven by who your, who your leaders are because they have to make the decisions with the team about those systems and processes. But ultimately, if you want to have a transformation in your team or organization's culture, it really comes down to how are you de designing those systems and processes? Are you democratically or are you designing them in that traditional command and control hierarchy? So if we're going to have a much more freedom-centered approach, you have to have the right framework. What is the right framework? And what do I mean when I keep saying this word democracy? Well, I spent over a decade researching what are the principles that create a democratic system. Most people... In you ask them on the street, how, how do you define what democracy is? They think democracy means voting. Um, voting is a way of making a decision. It is not, not, not democracy. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, they vote in North Korea. There's one choice on the ballot. You cast your vote, one choice. Does that mean it's democratic? Heck no, right? In order to have democracy, you actually have to recognize that it is a leadership system, an organizational uh, system. Uh, it's a system of governance and it's a system of leadership. It's two in one. And what are those principles that create democracy? Well, here's what our research found. Principles like transparency, accountability, choice, decentralization of power, the balance and respect for the individual and the collective, reflection and evaluation. And in my book, I actually go deeply into each one of these 10 principles and show you how they can be practiced based on uh, World Blue Certified Freedom Center companies worldwide. So let's make this a little bit more practical. Designing the right systems and processes, in other words, how you get things done, is proven to to create more lasting, scalable collaboration, freedom, and ultimately more happiness in the workplace. How does this look? All right. Well, let me just give you some simple examples. Undemocratic systems and processes look like closed books, secret society communications, micromanagement, fiefdoms, unfair bonuses, where the CEO decides everything and a lack lack of accountability. Democratic systems and processes look like things like open book management, town hall meetings, self-management, decentralized teams. You all, you all know about this with the Agile method. Um, something called peer impact bonus awards. I talk about this in the book. Voting consensus or consent-based decisions. There's actually three ways to make uh, decisions democratically. An accountability pledge, so on and so forth. I give 50 examples in the book. But I just want you to see that difference between undemocratic systems and processes and democratic ones. All right, let me tell you a couple quick stories and I'll wrap up here. Um, for example, HCL Technologies, they're one of our larger companies we've worked with. They're actually based in India. Um, they have 120,000 employees. And you may think, wow, how can a company that big work democratically? And absolutely they can. Their CEO um, at the time was Vineet Nair. He's written a book about HCL technology is called Employees First, Customer Second. And they had flipped the corporate pyramid, as he says it, and really given power to the people to create a democratic model. Now, this democratic model got really tested um, during the last Great Recession back in 2008. What happened was they were going to have to uh, lay people off 
or find a way to save $100 million. So save $100 million or lay people off. So Vineet, the CEO and his leadership team decided they had a strong, healthy democratic culture. They wanted to open up to their employees please let them know what was going on. Let them know the challenge instead of just, you know, firing people, let everybody in on the problem, be transparent, uh, practice that um, decentralized decision-making and get input from everybody on how to solve the problem. So they invited people to put forth ideas for how to save a hundred million dollars. Several hundred ideas came in. They were able to implement 76 of the ideas. And rather than saving $100 million, they saved $260 million and no one was laid off. So just a fabulous example of how when you give power to your people, engage them in a highly democratic way, you can really have amazing results. One more quick story and a whole different Bain company called Dream Host. They're a worldly certified freedom center company out in LA. They're a tech company. They've got about 350 employees. And Dream Host did something really interesting. We helped them create those democratic systems and processes for how to get stuff done. They took those systems and processes, they implemented them into their spin off company. They sold their spinoff in 24 months. It grew so quickly with this democratic uh, leadership style. They were able to take the spinoff from zero to $175 million sale in just 24 months. So once you get those democratic systems and processes in place, you really can scale very quickly. Again, it has to be principle-based. You have to know what you're doing. We taught them how to do it and they were able to have fabulous results. So in summary, again, those three shifts that you can make from hierarchical leadership to much more democratic leadership, it's about having a freedom-centered rather than fear-based mindset, freedom-centered leadership, and freedom-centered organizational design. And again, overall, how, this isn't just an airy fair utopian idea. We had third-party research done that found that companies that practice freedom at work have on average... 700% greater revenue growth compared to S&P 500 companies over a three-year period. WD40, one of our world blue certified companies and our work with them lead freedom and democracy rather than fear and control. Their sales quadrupled and their market cap increased from 250 million to over $2 billion. Fabulous publicly traded company. I'm sure we all know what WD40 is. So in summary, three steps to shifting from hierarchical to, hierarchical to democratic leadership for breakthrough success. Number one, have a mindset of freedom and possibility rather than fear and control. And I gave you that power question practice, those five questions for how to do that. Number two, lead with freedom, not fear. Cultivate high self-worth in yourself and others. Creates just a fabulous environment to work in when you're working with high self-worth people. And, and I do in my book, if you're not already a 10, I give you 10 ways to help develop that higher sense of self-worth within yourself. And last, give power to your people by designing democratic rather than hierarchical systems and processes. Here's where you can find me. Thanks so much for being with me on this Thursday evening. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. You're welcome to visit our website. Check out the book. We're going to uh, send out a couple books. And yes. thank you again so much for being with me. Hey, Tracy, thank you so much for, uh, and thanks for coming back on camera. It's good to see you too, right? Yeah. Uh, super, super interesting um, stuff. I, I knew it because this was my, this is this was my beach book in summer. Um, man, I was hanging at the beach and, and people looked at me, what is he reading at the, at the beach? But it was a fascinating book uh, and I couldn't put it down. So um and uh, probably everybody in the audience, I would assume, is like, what is Ubuntu, right? So even that is worth getting the book and looking up. And there's a super, it's, a, it's a deep word. There's a lot to it, right? So um, it. interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, crazy. Give me a number between three and 20. Six. Six? 16. Okay, that, 16, oh, okay. you said? Okay, hold yeah. on. That, 11. Hold on, that would be... Okay, so we have Jim Dermond, if I pronounce this correctly, 
I just put an email address into the chat. Jim, you are 16 and uh, on my screen, this, this is obviously different on our screen. Um, do you want a book, an autographed book by uh, Tracy? Um, also, give me another number between three and 20 and not 16. Let's go with lucky number seven. The seven, okay. That would be David Mayer. That would be David Mayer. Send me an email, um, both of you. Send me an email to, to that email address in the chat with your shipping address, and I'll get that book to you. It's autographed by Tracy. It's a unique uh, thing, and I just wanted to raffle that off. Oh, exactly. Woohoo! Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so we have we have a little bit of time, uh, Tracy. But we want to keep you here for a few more minutes uh, for some yeah. questions. You can you can either voice them, uh, then you will be on the recording, right? Or you can just put them on the in the chat if that's uh, if that's your preference. Any kind of questions to um, to Tracy? Yeah, and you can put the question in chat if you want, or um, like like Joe said, unmute yourself. Um, yeah. Okay. I see Richard's question. Yeah. How do you find companies that have deployed this? Well, um, you know, we've been doing this for 25 years, uh, Richard. So at this point, uh, companies come to us <laughs> and they say help and we help them, uh, deploy it. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going on chat off a of chat, but I, yeah. Jim, you had your hand up actually, I think before I saw Diane's question, go ahead, Jim. Yeah. I can't always see everyone, so I apologize if I miss, miss yeah, you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tracy. That was yeah. very inspiring. Um, my question is um, about the peer, um, the way that peers kind of uh, decide on on compensation, uh, peer impact bonus awards. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting practice. Oh, you grab you grabbed onto my teaser. I gave a teaser on that one. Um, so there's a lot to say on this gym, but I'll give you the big picture and um, I can actually give you, we have a YouTube channel, um, World Blue Does, where I have a great video by Carrie Brandis that she describes this. So the way a peer impact, and I talk about it in the book too, the, the way the peer impact bonus awards work is, you know, it's a big issue in companies is how to do bonuses democratically. And a lot of times people feel that bonus bonuses are unfair because it's either based on a uh, positional title um, or length of time at the company. And what this particular worldly certified company wanted to do was to say, we want to honor and recognize um, based on merit. And so the way the peer impact bonus awards work is once the way the company does this, and you can modify it, is once a quarter, uh, they give out to everybody a certain number of points. And the points are tied to a dollar amount. And they say to everybody, they've built a system for how to do this. They say to everyone, go and distribute your points. Each point represents a certain dollar amount. Distribute your points to uh, who you think deserves a bonus. And it's fabulous because, you know, you might think, oh, like, do, do the popular people get, you know, more money or do the louder people get more money? And uh, as they've done this year over year, you know, people know, you know, who's getting the work done and you know, who isn't. And they find that even the quiet people um, definitely get recognized. And so they do that about once a quarter. And then based on the number of points, that's your bonus. And um, kids, the head of HR, she, she also could see a ranking of where people came out. So that's a great way too, if you're people aren't performing very well, there's an opportunity to go and talk with them, you know, seeing how they come out. So it's a, it's a very democratic and merit, meritocracy way of doing things. So yeah, that gives you a brief, brief glimpse at it, but you can definitely read more in the book and the channel. There's a video. Thanks for asking. Okay. Let's see. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Diane asked, how, where do you recommend starting in large global companies? Uh, Diane, are you on are you, can I, where are you? There you are. I see you, Diane. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great question. Um, and do you mean in terms of starting in large companies? Well, it's, when, uh, you, when you yeah. have a really large company with, you know, lots of moving parts, do you start with the most senior leadership or do you start like one team at a time, which is kind of the agile way where you, you know, experiment and use the, uh, uh, transformation kata that we learned from uh, Joe. Um, so I'm just curious what, yeah. what you've seen work well. 
Yeah. Well, it really depends. You can do both. So when we have the CEO saying, yes, I'm in like HCL Technologies, 120,000 employees, then we can really work from the top down. And ultimately the CEO does have to buy in, you know, um, in order for this to really obviously take root um, in very large organizations, but that doesn't also work on a smaller team basis. So a lot of times with divisions or teams, certainly, um, again, it's it's the top leaders usually of, of that team or division, they certainly have to be bought in and uh, we can work with them there. You know, great place to start is read the book, you know, see if you agree with it, see if you like the philosophy and the practice. Um, you can always slip somebody a book, ha happy Christmas present or happy holidays present, you know? <laughs> So yes, Diane, you can do both is the answer to your question. Thanks for your great question. Okay, John asked, how do leadership teams get comfortable and accept democratic decisions? Um, that's a great question, John. <laughs> you know, and are you are you there as well? Let me see, I'm looking for you. Um, I don't know if he's still on or not. Yeah, there you are, John, great, I see you, fabulous. Okay, um, well, Again, if you're if you're going to practice democratic leadership, hopefully you're open to democratic decision making and recognize that um, in order to have good decisions, just like anything, you have to inform citizens. You know, you have to have your you have to build a company of citizens, not a company of renters. So people have to be engaged in their uh, knowledge and understanding. So that that's why democracy is a system, right? You have to have transparency of information, um, honest information, so that people can make really good decisions together. And then you have have to decide what decision-making method are we going to use? Are we using a majority vote, consent-based or consensus-based decision-making? I do talk about this at, at, in depth in the book, um, but you have to decide which method of decision-making makes sense for the gravity of the decision. So there's more I can say on this, but I'll leave it at that, John. I hope that's okay. Um, David asked, what's usually the most challenging step? I think the most challenging thing is it's very difficult for low self-worth leaders to embrace a democratic leadership style. If you aren't secure in who you are, um, it's going to feel very, very threatening to work this way. We recognize that. Um, every company we work with, we actually vet the CEO to make sure they are ready um, um, to a democratic style. So I think the most challenging step is with the leaders feeling feeling secure enough and who they are to want to give power to their people. Great question, David. Sorry, I didn't have you go on camera. I just dived right in with that. I hope that's okay. Um, Richard, it's change management. Yeah, have to have top-down support. You absolutely do at the end of the day. You know, if you're in a big enough, enough division, I'll let you go and do your thing and just build a great team. That's awesome. But we work at World Blue. We work directly with the C-suite, the CEO, and do do that change top down. I'd love to say, hey, democracy, it's grassroots, bottom up. No, nope, doesn't work that way in companies. It's got to be, unfortunately, the top down. Um. Oh, thanks, Diane. I saw that you bought it. That's great. Can it work in the public sector? Se Absolutely. We have worked in the nonprofit sector, for-profit sector, public sector. We've worked with schools. Um, we've worked with sports teams even. And I highlight all of those in the book. So every yeah. single sector we have worked in. And um, it's democracy. It's freedom. It can work everywhere. But you have to have leaders who are ready to implement it. The only way it's not going to work again, come back to that self-worth. John likes consensus. I think most people like consensus. Most people like to feel that people are bought in. And you know, sometimes people roll their eyes with consensus. They think, oh my gosh, it's going to take forever. But it's a tortoise and hare situation, right? When you go slow to get that ownership and buy-in, sometimes, you know, that takes time. But then when you implement, if people have an ownership and buy-in sense, you're able to move much faster. Yeah. Fabulous. All right. I know we're at 6.01 East Coast yeah. time. So <laughs> Tracy, this was awesome. Thank you so much. This, uh, and uh, for everyone, right? I think the, the number when you started all this was 1997, right? And yeah, uh, yeah, 25 maybe, years ago, I started World Blue. Yes, um, unbelievable. I mean, just a round of applause so for Tracy yeah. because that is so much passion for a topic for 25 years, and you yeah. can still feel it today. This is awesome. Thank you, Tracy. It's, I'm living my purpose, so it's a joy, freedom.
never dies, right? <laughs> so it's great to be with all of you. Thank you for your fabulous participation and wonderful in-depth questions. I knew I was going to get smart questions from such a great group. So I awesome. really appreciate work with such fabulous people. And feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, if you have any questions that we didn't get to today, I'm certainly happy to answer them anytime. Excellent. So thanks well, again so much for having me. Excellent. We're going to have a follow-up email with, with all that information as well as where the video is going to be, but people want to relive the moment. Thank you, Tracy. For everybody else, have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm still here. Oh, David's here. Okay, bye. <laughs> and an object.